former President Barack Obama issuing a warning to the Democratic Party. Don't attack your own. Here he is speaking Saturday at an Obama Foundation town hall event in Berlin, Germany, where they love him. One of the things I do worry about sometimes uh, among progressives in the United States, maybe it's true here as well, um, is a certain kind of rigidity where we say, ah, I'm sorry, this is how it's going to be. And then we start sometimes creating what's called a uh, circular firing squad where you start shooting at your allies. Meantime, House Speaker Nancy Pelosi painting a rosier picture, telling the Washington Post she'll secure the House majority for Democrats in the 2020 elections by this November. But this comes as the New York Times reports the House Democratic campaign arm is close to open warfare with the party's rising liberal wing. Ash political operatives close to... Nancy Pelosi, they're so ashy, uh, trying to <laughs> shut down primary challenges from the far left. New York Congresswoman Alexandra Ocasio-Cortez, who won her seat due to a primary challenge, blasting the Democratic Congressional Campaign Committee's move to break business ties with political consultants and pollsters who work for primary challengers. Ocasio-Cortez tweeting the DCCC's new rule to blacklist and boycott anyone who does business with primary challengers is extremely divisive and harmful to the party. My recommendation, if you're a small dollar donor, pause your donations to the DCCC <laughs> and give directly to swing candidates instead. The campaign armchair woman Sherry Busto standing by the committee's decision saying, quote, if we're going to be successful as Democrats and going into 2020 with a very, very fragile majority, we've got to be on the same team. Every cent we can to hang on to our majority and not work against ourselves. Uh, so Jessica, I saw you shaking your head there. Are you shaking your head at, at Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez, who's trying to mobilize her faction of the progressive army against the Democratic establishment? Yes. I was doing, <laughs> yeah. And I was doing a positive head shake listening to President Obama speaking in Berlin about this. Uh, this is something that scares a lot of Democrats, that there are purity tests mm -hmm. um, that are being put against people who have been moderate or left-leaning moderates their entire careers. What happened with Dianne Feinstein in California, I think, was one of the most extreme cases of this, uh, where a number of people were arguing that she was like Trump. People on the progressive side, Dianne Feinstein, who's committed 30 years to fighting climate change and social justice issues. Uh, what I think is interesting to raise at this point, you know, we've got to support each other. In, tw in 2016, there was a big problem with the Bernie faction getting on board for Hillary. Absolutely. But Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez tweeted about Mike Levin, who's a congressman in California, and her tweet alone supporting him raised $30,000. In an hour. For, in an hour. And that's important to pay attention to here, because she does have that kind of power. And people who are progressives, and I love that Ro Khanna comes on the network, for instance, he's part of that wing. Um, but there has to be a balance between supporting the DCCC, which has been a wonderful fundraising and support system for Democrats and also taking matters into your own hands. And if you want to tweet support for somebody, go ahead and do that. But there's no reason to be tearing down infrastructure that supports Democratic candidates. I mean, the two party system seems to be anachronistic at this point because there are so many competing factions. Is it impossible to bring them together? Well, I think this Democratic uh, primary campaign is going to be interesting because I think, obviously, Barack Obama knows how he got elected. It was running as kind of a post-partisan healer, not a lot of sharp ideological message. And I, I think he's looking at what's happening now where Bernie Sanders has forced, uh, for example, every Senate Democrat running for president to endorse the Green New Deal, which includes socialized medicine. Uh, if these are the purity tests, not that's, all of them have. That's a yeah. hard sell. Well, they've all co-sponsored the Green New Deal. Now, some of them later said, "Well, you know, I I meant it or I didn't mean it," but uh, but I, I think that is a tough sell to the American people. To if if you have to have this hardy ideological edge mm -hmm. to win the nomination. I think it's, it's painful that what we're talking about here is money. I mean, that's what they're talking about: is is who are you going to support and who are you going to help? They said we have every cent has to go in this direction. Mm -hmm. I hate having, I mean, this is what we all talk about all the time, money and politics married all the time. I had Carl Rove on Friday, and he said that there's been a huge sea change in terms of fundraising, that it used to be the few big donors, and now it really is about the grassroots, individual, small donors. That's where the big money is, which has changed everything, and it's fascinating. And that's why, like you said, those tweets and the individual people really count now. Mm -hmm. Yeah.
Harris? Well, just real quickly, you're seeing a coupling of that message and those smaller donations along with now, I think it is the 13th state that has pushed in primary season and beyond for single votes to count rather than the electoral system. So obviously that's about 2020. But the two kind of go hand in hand because you have an idea of who's going to vote based on those smaller uh, donations and you see certain states trying to push for that uh, among Democrats because it's important. If, if the electoral system is not there, the delegate system is not there. Can they win per votes? How about winning on ideas? No, that's too ordinary. All right.